this is about a larger systemic change about the kind of system we operate in. I believe that this is the moment that we need democracy more than ever. We need more people of all types of backgrounds to step up and offer their expertise to solve the challenges in each of our communities. Let's do what we know to be the right thing and be true to that inner voice. I didn't ask to be treated differently, but I'm gonna take it on because I have a job to do and nothing's gonna get in my way of doing that. Go get yourself a political home. You know, Vote Relief would love to be that home. Black Voters Matter would love to mm -hmm. be that home for you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for leading and running as you are. And I have your back. Great. Welcome, everyone. My name is Erin Velarde, and I'm the founder of Vote Run Lead, and we train women to run for office and win. And this is week three of Your Kitchen Cabinet, Every Woman's Virtual Campaign Team. Um, and this is the highlight of my week. And I say that also having, the, having had the ability to have a conversation with Governor Gretchen Whitmer, but it's number two compared to this gathering every Saturday because this is where it's at. Um, the community uh, that is Vote Run Lead, all of you who are working to help women run and win, and those of you who are yourselves candidates, um, looking to see how you, one, stay competitive in these times of uncertainty, um, and this sort of how you actually campaign in times of social distancing. So um, we're very grateful for having you spend your Saturday mornings with us, and we're very grateful to sort of be in this virtual community with all of you. Um, so in the chat, we want to share where we're coming from. Oh, great. We have somebody who's already <laughs> kicked it off. Julie from Des Moines. Love it. We've got LA in the house. We've got Hudson. We've got New York. We've got Arkansas. Every, every week, awesome. Seattle. This is fantastic. Washington, D.C., Minnesota, Illinois, California. Um, amazing. It's going too fast. Grand Rapids, Michigan. Love all of it. Fort Worth, Texas. Um, we have an amazing network. Um, and we have an amazing set of panelists for you today. We're talking about what are voters thinking? Um, and you're gonna get some polling, you're gonna get some analysis from three, let me actually say four brilliant women. Um, Dr. Nicole Bauer is with us today. Um, Paku Hang, who you all know as our chief program officer. Um, I would consider her one of your experts today, a political scientist by training. Uh, Jane Rayburn is joining you. Um, she has a, an amazing, uh, presentation on sort of what's happening right now, how people are really feeling. So I would get your pen and paper out for this one because there's going to be some facts and figures that you're really going to want to take down um, as they share some of their analysis. Um, and uh, all of our presenters are, are pretty fantastic. So um, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I want to tell you that your presentations, the two presentations you'll see will come to you in your email following this. So no need to sort of be tracking that or screenshotting anything. You will get access to all of these documents. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Paku Hang. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Erin said, my name is Paku Hang. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Vote Run Lead, and I'm so excited to have you all joining us. Um, before we get started, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna share my screen so that um, we can just go over some um, we can, I can talk a little bit about how the next hour is going to unfold. Great. So um, we're, what we're gonna do in the next hour is I'm gonna introduce you to our kitchen cabinet members and they're gonna each give um, a five minute presentation and then we'll actually open it up um, and just have audience questions from the audience. Um, I wanna talk a little bit also about the culture of these calls. Like Aaron said, this is um, the third in a series. The first um, call that we did, we focused on direct voter contact and fundraising in the time of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, last week we talked about GOTV or getting out the vote and protecting voters' rights. And this week, we're going to be talking about communications and how voters are feeling and thinking. And so with that in mind, we do want to be respectful of your time. And this call will end um, and at, the, um, at the end of the hour. But we will keep the Zoom channel open if anybody wants to continue talking or asking questions. Um, we ask that you all keep your, um, your audio muted so that we can just have the best type of um, audio throughout this call. And you'll notice that the 
the bottom of your toolbox, um, if you click on the participant um, feature, that's an opportunity for you to raise your hands. Feel free to do that throughout the um, throughout the session or the call. If you have any questions, or um, if you go into the chat box, you can also uh, text or uh, type in your questions in the chat box. And feel free to add your comments or your thoughts in the chat box. And let's just be active. Now, we were also thinking that since this week we're going to be focusing on, um, you know, public opinion or public surveys that maybe we could do a couple of polls ourselves. And so also at the bottom in the participant tab, if you click on it, you'll see that there's an option for polling where you can answer yes or no. And so we're going to be doing some of that throughout the call. And in fact, let's, let's uh, test that. Let's test some of that poll today. So, um, I, my first question to you all in our polling will be, um, and Mark, is that ready? Okay, great. So the first question is, what is your age range? If you could click the answer that best describes you. The second question is, please specify your ethnicity. And then the third question is, given the list below, please click on what best describes you. Are you currently in public office? Um, are you currently a candidate? Are you working on a campaign? Do you plan to run in the future? Are you interested in politics or something else? And then our fourth polling question for right now is, how are you feeling this morning? where number one is very tired, and number five is full of energy. So once you've filled out these questions, um, feel free to submit your response. And I think right off the bat, we'll be able to see the polling results. Is that right? Mark? Mark is our digital guru. So there we are. These are the other um, folks who are in the call with us. We have a lot of 35 and 54 year olds. We have a very diverse population. We have a lot of folks who are currently candidates right now. And people are feeling in the middle, but mostly full of energy. Fantastic. So this is what we're going to be doing throughout the call. So I just want to get you guys familiar to some of that. And then um, I kind of want to dive in now. I want to dive into our speakers. Um, I'm trying to move our slide. Um, so our first speaker is um, Professor Nicole Bauer. Uh, professor Bauer is an assistant professor of political communication in the Department of Political Science and the Manship School of Mass Communications at Louisiana State University. She conducts research that identifies how voters respond to the strategic political messages of female political candidates and how female po political candidates develop campaign strategies. She's also the author of The Qualification Gap, Why Women Must Be Better Than Men to Win Political Office. This book is scheduled for publication in the fall of 2020 by Cambridge University Press. Our second speaker is going to be Jane Ines uh, Rayburn. Uh, Jane has over 17 years experience as a survey and public opinion research and pollster. She is a vice president at EMC Research, where she manages all aspects of research projects, from designing the questionnaires to providing clients with actionable recommendations gleaned from the data. Jane works with a variety of clients, including political campaigns, public interest groups, advocacy organizations, and private companies. She graduated from University of Florida with a BA in political science and classics and competed in a master's in classical language at the University of Georgia. In 2020, Jane joined Emerson as an affiliated uh, faculty member. And then our third speaker is Christy Seltzer. Uh, Christy has more than 20 years experience in national politics as a political and communications strategist. She is the president of New Heights Communication, a uh, Washington DC based public affairs firm she founded in 2010. This firm sets national communication strategy and direct media relations for the AFL-CIO, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and the Service Employee International Union. 
Christie has served as a national spokesperson of the presidential campaigns of Vice President Al Gore, Vermont Governor um, Howard Dean, and Connecticut Senator Christopher Dodd. So um, VRL supporters, this is your amazing um, speakers today. And so let's get started. Um, Dr. Barr, can we begin with you? Yeah, let me share my screen. All right, well, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you guys and to share a little bit about my research um, about how to run for a political office. And I will say uh, there's, there's no research out there that says exactly how to run for a political office during a pandemic because uh, we weren't doing this kind of research in 1918, the last time we had a pandemic. But what I've done is piece together some snippets and highlights of research that I think is uh, useful and instructive right now. So I'm going to start a little bit with what we know about how anxiety works as a political emotion. And so anxiety is a really, really powerful political emotion because it leads people to seek information. But the anxiety is, is not, it doesn't lead people to seek good information. It leads people to seek all of the worst and terrible information. When people are feeling really anxious, like a lot of people are feeling right now, it leads them to seek information that confirms the, the worst impulses of the anxiety that they're feeling. So if you're feeling anxious about the economy right now, you're not going to go and look for information about how you know, the economy might be okay and it might recover. You're going to look for information about how the economy is never going to recover and you know we're all going to spiral into a black hole. Um, you're going to look for all of the worst information. And so when that happens for people, when they're engaged in this negative information seeking, it leads people to experience fear. And fear is a really, really terrible political emotion because when people are feeling afraid, it's very, very demobilizing, such that when people experience fear, they are less likely to turn out to vote. And so anxiety leads to negative information seeking, and negative information seeking can exacerbate anxiety so that it turns into fear. And then if people are afraid, they don't become fully engaged and they don't turn out to vote, which is not really helpful for, for any of you who are running for a political office. But there are ways to disrupt this process. And I think there are particularly useful ways that many of you as women who are running for political office can disrupt this process because the unique moment of this particular political crisis offers a women an opportunity to turn what are conventionally perceived to be weaknesses for women candidates into strengths. So in general, during normal political times, uh, we know that voters tend to want candidates who have you know, masculine traits and qualities like being tough, aggressive, and assertive. And Voters want candidates who are really strong on stereotypically masculine issues, and voters assume at a baseline that women just don't have these strengths. And these are just built-in implicit biases that a lot of people hold. But there's a unique moment right now in our, our political time because this public health crisis that we have actually plays into women's stereotypic strengths because most voters assume that women are experts on health as an issue. Health fits into a woman's stereotypic issue profile. And so because this is a public health crisis, 
it offers female candidates an opportunity to really play up their, their ability to navigate this complex issue. Um, in general, voters you know, aren't necessarily looking for candidates who show compassion, care, and empathy, but during this crisis, um, you know, voters are looking for more of these qualities, I think, in ways that we haven't seen before. So because of this really unique moment, and because voters are experiencing heightened levels of anxiety around an issue that plays into women's strengths, it's an opportunity for women to show that they have a lot of competencies that voters often assume they don't have, and it's also a way for women to show care and compassion and to engage in strategies and messaging that normally can be seen as a deficit for women. So it's a way for candidates to show a lot of care, compassion, and empathy while also demonstrating policy expertise and their ability to to navigate around this complicated issue. Um, it's also an opportunity for, I think, women candidates to do something that we know that women do really, really well once they're in political office, which is connecting with voters and their communities. And so we know that when women get into political office, no matter the level of political office, women are much, much better at constituent service and outreach. And they're also much better at passing legislation and doing a host of, of other things that we expect our representatives and leaders to do compared to male candidates, but in particular constituent service and connecting with members of their community is a huge strength of women politicians and it's something that voters reward women for doing well. And I think ways that you all can, you know, can engage in these activities um, and specific things you can do, which I just, I put some things down on the slides, but I think other, other experts here will talk more about that. Um, you know, anything you can do to connect with your community and your constituents would, it is something that voters will keep in mind when they're making decisions and when they're evaluating candidates, regardless of the level of office that you're running for. So I don't want to go on too long. So I'm just going to wrap things up because I'm really interested in your questions. Um, kind of three key things to keep in mind are to um, show that you're proficient at producing desirable outcomes from government especially from local levels of government, because that's the touch point for most people for during this time of crisis. Most people are getting services that they need from local levels or from community organizations that are completely outside of government. Um, and demonstrating skills like experience, knowledge, and competency. Um, I know this is hard and frustrating to hear, but there, and I've done a lot of research on this point. Um, these are all qualities that the average voter assumes the average woman candidate lacks, even though we know that all of the women who run for political office, and this includes all of you who are running for political office, are on average much more qualified than men who run for political office. Voters don't assume that to be the case. Um, so this is an opportunity to demonstrate experience and competency, and that can overcome a lot of biases. And I think the big key is to uh, disrupt the, the effects of anxiety that a lot of individuals are feeling because anxiety triggers negative information seeking that leads people to experience fear. And when people are afraid, they don't vote. And that is terrible for democracy. Uh, and then on the last slide, I have just some academic resources that some of you might find interesting. Those will get sent out at the end, but I'm gonna wrap it up there and hand it to the next speaker. But thank you all for being engaged and running for office. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Bauer. Um, 
I, what I'm hearing from your presentation, one of the take home points is really for our women candidates to really be themselves during this time. You know, the compassionate, caring person that they are, but also that they, so many of us already are leaders and to showcase our leadership, especially in this time of crisis. So thank you so much for that wisdom. Um, our next speaker is Christy Seltzer. Hey there. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different here. Um, I know that you're going to hear from both um, Dr. Bauer and from Jane, um, sort of more uh, theoretical. I'm going to go super practical here. Um, so I'm going to give you some you know, tips as to how you can uh, take what you're hearing from both of them and actually put it into practice for, uh, for your campaign. Um, so I am the um, president and founder, as I said, of New Heights Communications. and um, which is a communications media relations firm here in DC. Um, and as we discussed before I started the firm, I worked on a ton of campaigns. Um, so today we still work with candidates and political organizations like Emily's List to run their communications, do media trainings, digital ads, all of that. Um, this cycle, we are working with some great women candidates, including the one that I'm going to focus on specifically uh, which is um, Amy Kennedy, who's running in New Jersey's second district. That's the district where she is um, in the general running against um, Jeff Van Drew, the party switcher, um, and has and does have a primary opponent. Our primary has been pushed back to July. Um, so again, this is going to be a really tactical conversation so that you can implement whatever pieces seem relevant to your own campaigns. Um, so when this all started in about mid-March, um, our campaign had a strategy conversation with our kitchen cabinet, with the candidate, her spouse, um, and with senior campaign staff about how massively um, the coronavirus is going to affect the campaign, uh, how it affect everything, but specifically what that would mean for our campaign. And there were some, especially given that we've never been through this before, who really wanted to be pretty business as usual. Um, there were others in the campaign who had been part of previous campaigns while they were going through um, sort of a broader tragedy. Uh, there were people, um, for example, who had, you know, worked on races in New Orleans while there were hurricanes happening with a significant death toll. And those people argued pretty strongly and persuasively that everything had changed. This was not the moment to go political. Um, so we sort of what ended up happening, and, and obviously those voices, you know, um, one out um, was what that we went from being more or less a, a candidate campaign to more or less a public servant campaign um, that fit well, luckily, with the you know Kennedy model of public service, um, and it, and it also fit well with um, some pieces of Amy's bio. She's a former public school teacher. She's now a mental health advocate. So there were really pieces that um, that you know again drew well with. That, that type of work that we are now being called on to do. Um, so the biggest thing that I would say, again, especially because New Jersey is the, most, the second most affected state uh, next to New York, is that our campaign became about helping people in the community. And though it was, though it continues to be, I suppose, political in the sense of, you know, we're more than happy to you know, call on state and federal authorities for, you know, what we believe people need, um, but it's no longer, a, you know, Jeff Van Drew is a terrible person because blah, blah, blah. Those things feel very tonally off. Um, so in addition to, um, you know, reconsidering all of our public opportunities, um, obviously, you know, like every candidate, we stopped doing in-person things and, you know, every meet and greet became virtual, all of those, right? Um, on our fundraising, which I'll talk about for just one second, um, we had a conversation about whether you should ask for money at all, right? Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of candidates still did because you have to. Um, and we did as well. We did one soft fundraising ask, um, but couched it very differently. We talked about, you know, look, if it feels right for you and your financial situation, sort of please give and also highlighted the ways in which we were giving back at that point to the community, you know, community in need. Um, so again, the differences were really um, a lot of tonal ones. In addition, as far as what we actually changed um, in terms of the, the types of activities the campaign was taking on, on our website, first and foremost, um, you can see um, highlighted on the front page, um, COVID-19 resources. 
um, where we're looking at things like testing sites in New Jersey, what are numbers you can call for, again, mental health services, all of that. Um, we um, put out a couple op-eds that, again, highlighted the parts of her bio that make her of service in this moment, again, mental health and education. So these were, again, not your typical op-eds. They were a little bit more like what to do with your kids if you're parenting while working or how to keep your own anxiety at bay so that, you know, um, and that of your family, how to keep it all at a manageable level. We started doing a highly successful uh, Facebook Live series with a series of experts. So for example, we did one um, just last week on, or this week actually, with about 80 social workers on the inequities and in access to mental health care in healthcare and education, talking about how we need to prioritize affordable and accessible health care for everyone. Um, we're doing one um, upcoming with the former U.S. Surgeon General, again, on how to keep your family safe, asking, you know, allowing people to ask questions about, um, I don't know, is it okay to, do I have to wear gloves when I go to the grocery store and my mask? Is that okay? Is, should I not? You know, sort of some of those questions. Um, we're doing one, actually a couple with with teachers, again, talking about how to handle distance learning, including one in Spanish. Um, have one with a financial expert talking about dealing with unemployment. So again, you, you see what we're doing here. Um, and then on social media, again, while we're very, you know, we're still putting out things like, you know, calling on the federal government to not shut down USPS, like we'll do maybe a quick straight to camera video. Also sort of highlighting things like, um, you know, a quick video of Amy showing her kids making cards for healthcare workers and other frontline responders. And this has all been in pretty stark contrast to what our opponent has done actually. So she's continued using our opponent a very political tone. Um, and by that, I sort of mean like, for example, she's doing a daily response to the Trump briefings. It's our sense that this is, it's, this is too much. It's too, it's too political and it's sort of too jarring for this moment, that that's just not necessarily what people are looking for. They are looking for you to be um, of service to them, to show exactly how you would do that in office. Um, they're not necessarily looking for you to, um, to be as again, I guess I would just say typically political. Um, so there's been, you know, a tremendous, I think, amount of opportunity in this moment. Um, it's just a matter of, of understanding where the tone needs to be. I'll leave Wonderful. it there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christy. It also sounds like you're saying that in this moment, um, voters are reacting to you being vulnerable, right? Whether it was um, uh, Amy showing pictures with her kids or, you know, yeah. just that that actually is resonating with voters. I think it sure does. I mean, to the extent that you're able to say, look, I'm going through this too. We're all going through this together. Again, there's there's a little bit of sensitivity about the fact that, you know, they're Kennedys. They're, they're not exactly the same, you know, like the same as what everybody else's situation is. But, you know, but she also has five kids and she also, you know, like there's there's a lot of ways in which you can reach out and and show that, we're all being impacted by this right now. And I think that does resonate. Wonderful, thank you. So before we go to our, oh, sorry. I also wanna just note some of the things you're saying, Christy, um, and I apologize, I, I missed introducing you as well earlier, but we saw the article this week about the uh, presidents and prime ministers from other countries. Did anybody see that? It was this article that went around that said, you know, the countries that are having really strong responses have female presidents and prime ministers, New Zealand, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? Um, yeah. And we can drop that article in the chat. But one of the things I think that I found so sort of emotionally resonant was, I can't remember which country, but she read a book out loud to children and the audience was only children. And it was just about saying like, it's okay to be scared. Things are gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this. And it is such a different model of leadership that I think what you're saying so nicely ties to Dr. Bauer and that this is the opportunity to do all those things that you wish you could do on the campaign trail. Yes, you're doing it behind a screen, but those that human connection, that trying things a little outside the box, using experts from your own community, it just feels so, it just feels so resonant. Like, okay, this is a real person, not somebody who feels so far away from me. Government doesn't feel so inaccessible. Yeah. Thanks. So before we hear our next speaker, uh, Jane, who's going to have so much good data for us, I thought we could take actually one more poll. Um, so as Mark is teeing that up, there are going to be about um, <clears throat> three questions to this poll. 
And um, can, can folks see it? The so the first question is, right, um, in deciding when to reopen the economy, what is most important to you? Health and public safety, economic disruption and hardship or something else? Question number two, how optimistic are you that a woman will become president of the United States in your lifetime? Where one is I have very little optimism and five is I have a lot of optimism. Third question, how trustful are you of your governor and information coming out of your state government? Where one is I'm, I have very little trust and five being I have a lot of trust. And question number four, how trustful are you of information that's coming out of the White House? Where number one is I have very little trust. Number five is I have a lot of trust. So feel free to answer your questions and then submit your responses. And as soon as we're all done, Mark is gonna show us the results. So <laughs> almost overwhelmingly people, um, that are on this call care more about public health and um, public safety as what should be leading us in the decision to reopen the economy. Oh, folks are very optimistic that in our lifetime, we will have a woman president. I, I believe so too. How trustworthy, um, how trustful are we of our local government? We have a lot of trust, it looks like. And how trustful are we of our federal government? We, um, we don't have as much trust, unfortunately. Great. So I thought that was a great primer for Jane, who is an amazing pollster and mm. researcher and has a lot of good data for us. So take it away, Jane. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Saturday from uh, the South Shore of Massachusetts, where it snowed overnight. So I'm happy <laughs> to be here with all of y'all um talking about running uh <laughs> for office this morning and um, before i present my presentation um just one other piece of research that's not covered in the public poll that i'm going to talk to you all about this morning but um we all know that it takes um, a woman at least six times to be asked to run for office um whereas it might take a man one or none so those of you in the poll that said that you're considering to run for office but you're not actively doing it you're just interested in politics or you're helping out a campaign please consider this one of your six asks. We need your voice um, in democracy. So I sincerely hope you're running for something that you're passionate about. I'm gonna pivot over to um, this deck that I've got for you this morning. I probably won't be able to work through all of the data, um, but this will be shared with you guys. And I think there's some interesting tidbits in here um, that uh, I think it's interesting, but I guess I'm a little biased, huh? Um, this uh so this morning um i just wanted to talk a little bit about public sentiment we've heard some really great um research from dr bauer um and also from um christy about you know how they've been putting these things into practical action and this morning i just wanted to talk a little bit about some specific data points that back up all of the changes that we're making i think the question i'm most commonly asked right now is you know are things the same or are they different how do i continue traditionally campaigning um you know really ans uh, being asked a lot of the questions um, that christy was talking about in her presentation so um my company emc research um we did a, a nationwide survey um, of voters and also the general population but this morning i'm just going to talk to you about those voters um, I will say just to uncover the lead, the sentiments between the general population and likely voters was not very different. Um, but just to sort of see, you know, how are people acting differently? Are people acting differently? I think we're all making these assumptions, but we read the news. I'm actually a Floridian, even though I live in Massachusetts and, you know, I know my home state is um, said that the WWE are essential services and they've opened up the beaches last night. So, you know, are people really acting differently? And, you know, according to this data, they are and across all different segments of states, right? So I've divided these states into blue, which go traditionally in a, a um, presidential election for a Democrat. Slow down a little bit. Can you slow down just a hair for us? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Um, of course. Um, purple states, which are traditionally swing states, so these are, you know, those states that we often hear about in the news that can go either way, and then red states, which are traditionally Republican. Um, but you can really see across um, 
across the board, um, people are changing their habits. They made sig significant changes to their daily life um, in, in every single one of these states, including those red states that we've been hearing are a lot about and purple states like Florida. Um, and, you know, even where there were protests just yesterday about people wanting to, you know, reopen the economy and go out into the public. Um, for the most part, people are avoiding contact with folks outside of their home, and this includes campaigns. Um, I think when this first started, there was a lot of thoughts of, well, should I still drop lit? Um, you know, should I uh, try and, you know, do something that's still personal and interactive? And for the most part, people are avoiding contact, and I think that remains true for campaigns. We want to make sure that we're respecting people's personal space and um, just this environment that we're in. Um, folks are also reducing their spending, and I think this is particularly true. I know lots of my clients have seen it as well when it comes to fundraising for campaigns. We're in a new era of fundraising. It's a lot more difficult, um, but at the end of the day, you do still have to have money to run your campaign. So what do we do? I guess we'll talk about that as well. Um, interestingly, you know, there's been, uh, we were, as we were prepping for this call, we're kind of chatting about, uh, you know, I know my parents, for example, um, especially early on, we're really still going out into the world. They live in Florida and there was not a stay at home order. So things were business as usual. Um, I think we've seen that change over time. Um, folks, particularly older folks, are very much so avoiding contact with people outside of their homes. Um, and we also know that older folks, um, you know, even though we're trying to bring new voters into the electorate, make sure that the um, young younger voters are showing up and that their voices are heard, um, the older voters are still the backbone of the electorate. Um, they're still, you know, the folks who are voting the most uh, often, they're the highest propensity voters and they make up the largest share of likely voters. And these folks are certainly avoiding contact with people outside of their home. This slide I call my bittersweet slide. It's kind of depressing, but I think it's important and really resonates particularly with what um, both um, uh, Professor Bauer and Christy were saying, you know, about this personalized connection. Um, folks are craving socialization, their family, their friends, they're missing that human contact. It's the number one thing um, when we ask the question, what do you miss most about life before the effects of COVID-19? Um, by far and away, folks said other people. So as you're thinking about how this informs your campaign messaging, you know, we, um, you know, as women, I think this is our natural inclination. Um, but when we're thinking about being candidates for political office, you know, give the people what they need. And, and in some ways, that's just, um, you know, people, um, each other. Um, you know, there are some other residual things here as well, like leaving the house freedom. Um, I, I personally miss going out to eat. I would love to go to a restaurant right now. And I, like what I wouldn't give, right? Um, to sit outside, although it is snowing outside, so maybe not outside, but, um, you know, I think there are, you know, all of these other little things, um, but really that human interaction is paramount for voters right now. So some interesting trust numbers. Um, I think that this uh, echoes what's already been said, but folks are really trying to figure out in their campaign, you know, how do we relate to what's happening in the overall political environment? Um, and I thought this slide was particularly interesting because the numbers don't change, particularly in the level of trust in government when it comes to the administration. So even in red states and purple states, that amount and the intensity of distrust is as, as high as it is in democratic states. So I think a lot of folks feel like, you know, maybe I, I shouldn't touch this or I should keep my opinion to myself. I'm running in a very conservative place. But, you know, to the extent that we do need to acknowledge the political environment and how it exists, you know, there is a lot of distrust for the president and the administration at this moment. Um, that uh, trust um, intensity uh, completely drops off when we talk about um, state and local government. And I think that's great, especially I was looking at the chat box of um, the level of government that lots of women um, are running for on this call. Um, and really, this is where, you know, the major change happens. Um, state houses, um, you know, uh, city council, um, these are important offices and voters have a lot more trust in them right now. And um, to echo um, what uh, Christy said explicitly, um, and actually I think uh, Nicole did as well, but this idea that, you know, you are getting your services, your constituent services, your, your trust from your local government. Um, and we're really seeing that resonating overall and across the different states as well. 
Um, we did look at just an age breakdown as well. Um, there's just higher trust in governments overall among older voters, particularly those that are over 65. Um, so again, when you're thinking about your electorate, you're looking at those high propensity voters, those older voters, and trying to figure out how to communicate with them. You know, I think this echoes again, um, most of what's been said, but coming to them from a place of uh, showing how you will lead, right, as, as a local representative um, is really important. Um, they're starting out with some innate trust um, in um, the government, and I think um, showing that you can be a good steward of that trust is really important during this time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, at the end of this about um, folks right now are really trusting science, which is actually not as sentence, I can really believe that I'm saying coming from a home state where they outlawed the use of climate change as uh, in the state house. You're not allowed to say that phrase in Florida for a little while. Um, but folks are really trusting, and again, across blue, purple, and red states, hospitals, the CDC, these are the things that pop as where voters are feeling like there's a good response coming from those folks. Um, good responses also coming again from local government, less so from the administration and from Congress. Um, both Democrats in Congress and Republicans in Congress and Trump are at the bottom of this chain in terms of how folks feel that the response has been, um, but really where they're saying that their concerns have been addressed are up at the top when it comes to these, you know, um, big uh, science organizations um, and their state and local government. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple slides just for time's sake and hop over. Um, these were just, uh, I thought this one was interesting. Um, when we think about um, messaging and, you know, talking about um, in the many ways that um, response to COVID-19 has failed, right, citizens, I think that we can agree for the most part, there are things that we could have done sooner and, and things like that, but where uh, um, voters are actually placing the blame, um, this is pretty interesting. Um, so more so people who are ignoring stay at home orders across all of the ideological breakdowns of states than the administration. And um, the, there is a marginally higher um, intensity behind totally to blame with the administration and it, when it comes to red states which I think is super fascinating. We do have to account a little for margin of error, which is sort of the pillow that we as pollsters give ourselves for statistical validity, but um, thought that was pretty interesting that even between blue states and red states, there was just a little more intensity behind that blame um, for um, the administration. So what does all this mean? What's different? What's the same? What do we do, right? That's why we're all here this morning talking about this. So one thing I do wanna reiterate and um, you know, voters hear thousands of pieces of persuasive messaging every day. This could be billboards, jingles, mail pieces, TV ads, advertisements, and I don't necessarily mean from um, political campaigns, but any type of organization, company that's doing persuasive messaging. Um, in our campaigns, we must whittle it down to be one of the four things, you know, you might see 3,000 pieces of persuasive information. Um, most folks' brains will acknowledge that they've seen it, that they liked it, that they felt persuaded by it, and that they will remember it to less than five pieces of persuasive messaging. So we have to cut through the noise. Positions on COVID-19 or its response, how government's doing, um, you know, pointing fingers at the administration, talking about really in the weeds um, solutions to testing or vaccinations, this is not going to win or lose a race. Um, voters, um, what we've seen in both this national survey and then we're doing lots of candidate work across the country, including some of the hot spots like um, Seattle, San Francisco, um, and New England, um, voters are still picking other issues as the most important. So um, in the height of COVID-19 um, in the Bay Area, we did a survey and the top testing issue um, over COVID-19, and they had all been in quarantine for quite some time, was still homelessness, which is the, the most um, commonly cited issue um, in uh, the Bay Area, and it has been for years. The same is true with Seattle. So we still need to find the intersection of what voters, what will cut through the noise with voters, and, and also what's durable. A good message is durable. So in our post-COVID-19 world, you know, we need to make sure that our campaign message can last. Now, I'm not trying to insinuate we shouldn't talk about it at all. That's hootenanny, right? Like we're all in our houses on the Zoom meeting because of COVID-19. So 
it is a conversation starter. And I think, you know, campaigns as you're reaching out and um, Christy and Nicole have already given us so much good information about how to do this, but a simple, how are you doing is a good conversation starter to open the door with voters. Um, they are receptive to criticism right now. And I think I've shown you plenty of data to show that of both Republic, uh, incumbents and Republicans, but you know, at the end of the day, as Christy was saying, you know, we really don't want to be overtly political in that. And there is a way to do it. And I think a lot of that is pivoting back to those issues that we know are going to outlast the campaign and that are still the top of mind issues for voters in your community. And I know that that data point is really it was hard for me to swallow and I didn't believe it until I saw it in my own research dozens of times and multiple other public polling presentations. But it, it is true that, that voters are still looking um, at other issues in their community and they're still very worried about it. Um, so what do we do? We tie these conversations about COVID-19 back to your message. So um, you want to show voters how you're going to lead. Um, I think this is a really um, nice underscore for a lot of the advice that's already been given about constituent services, providing resources, um, trying to be helpful. Um, being compassionate, again, a point that's already been ma made, but I just want to underscore it. You must be able to connect with your voters and show them um, that you, know, you are um, understanding that you're compassionate, that you're empathetic, even if your concerns are very different from theirs. Um, you know, this is a, a principal tenet of campaigning and it remains true in this COVID-19 campaign environment. And again, be concrete. So when you are talking about COVID-19, remembering that folks are looking to the science right now, a slide that's not in this deck, but a good piece of information, the most trusted public figure right now um, is Fauci when we're talking about COVID-19. So he is, people trust him across both sides of the aisle. He is the number one source that people look to. Um, and so they're really, and you know, you think about that, um, you know, high rating and responses for the CDC, for hospitals, folks are looking to healthcare workers, they're looking to the science. And so really when you're talking about these things, you wanna be concrete and do the same. And my final thing um, is a little bit less of messaging, but you can't knock doors right now. But we certainly don't recommend that, but campaigning must go on. Um, you know, as women, we have a stronger, a, a more steep uphill battle. Um, that's just the nature of the game. And so we have to continue campaigning. Um, we might have to make some adjustments in this environment, but please don't stop because you feel that it's, um, you know, we, I've had a lot of clients say, well, I feel like it's really invasive or intrusive or inappropriate to campaign right now. Um, and it's not, you know, voters are craving, we're having amazing response rates in polling because voters are craving interaction. They're craving engagement and they want their voice to be heard. Um, so please continue um, on your campaign efforts. Um, and I hope that some of this information has helped you do that. Um, here's my contact information, but I think we're going to talk a little bit more. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. So we're going to open up the floor now or the call to questions from you all, but I'm going to get started. And then if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and Mark or Maria Elena will unmute you and, and then they'll tell you when to ask it. But my first question um, to get us started is I wanted to go back to Dr. Bauer. Um, you had said that, you know, um, in times of anxiety, people seek out negative information and then that leads to fear and fear leads to immobilization. And I was wondering, um, when people are feeling fear, how, can we combat that with a message of like optimism or a message of uh, uplifting message? Like, can that neutralize fear, or is fear overwhelming? That 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 as a campaign, you can't message and and and, um, and neutralize it. Yeah, fear is pretty overwhelming once a, once a person gets to that point, right? Like you mentioned when you're, when you're afraid, it's, you know, you run and you hide and you, you are paralyzed, right? So the fight or flight response, if you're afraid, you run and hide. If you're angry, like, I don't know, lots of people in Wisconsin were a couple of weeks ago, you go out and do things. Um, and so once people get to the point where they're afraid, it's, it's like they're too far gone. And so you really have to disrupt the process with the messaging beforehand, right? You have to stop people from kind of spiraling through the negative information mm -hmm. search by just giving them more useful information, right? Or more optimistic information or helpful information. That doesn't mean, you know, give them inaccurate information or like everything's going to be fine we'll be back to normal in a few weeks because that's not accurate or true but it means just disrupting the process uh, more quickly because once people are to the point where they're afraid it's really really hard to break them out of that 
I feel like that goes back to what, you know, you and Christy and Jane have been saying that even in this time, we have to continue campaigning, right? Because that's part of the disruptive process. Great. Yeah. Um, Mark, do we have any questions? Any uh, questions right now? Yep, we have a question from Jackie. Go ahead, Jackie. Hi, um, I ran for mayor of a small community that I live in outside Chicago four years ago. Uh, I got very close to winning, a half a percentage point. Uh, I was planning to announce again on April sixth, which is one year to the date for the next election, April sixth, twenty twenty one. I did not announce because we're in the middle of COVID. When is a good time to announce, given what's going on? I mean, I know the November elections, people have already announced, they're campaigning, they're fundraising, but I don't feel like I can just jump in at this point. Yeah. Christy, you have a lot of experience with you know, these real life dynamics. What do you think? Yeah, when, so when is the, um, when's the election? It's next November? April, 2021. Oh, sorry, April 2021, right. I, honestly, like, I, I would probably wait until states are starting to open and things like that again. So I'd pro I probably would give it another couple of months. Um, and again, just because people are going to be in a bit of a different headspace right now, I feel like it's going to be, it's going to be tuned out for at least a couple of months. So that's what I would say. Would you suggest, though, so some of the things you talked about were like being of service, you know, getting those emails out, you know, like, I, I would, I think what I'm hearing our presenter say, Jackie, is like, start to be of service, start to get that name recognition back up. But that date, yeah, is probably looking like a summer date. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Yeah, I've been doing that. So I'll keep on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jackie. Who's next, Mark? Sure, we have uh, Angela. Go ahead, Angela. Hi, thank you. Um, I am the campaign manager for a candidate in Colorado for the House District. Um, we are in a situation where the incumbent is organizing protests at the state capitol to open up the state. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there was some statements about we don't that's not a wedge issue. But what we're seeing is that we raised $3,000 in 24 hours as a result of this. What, what kinds of things would you suggest to us to be able to, to take, use that to our advantage? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just start. I mean, look, there is right now like an extreme minority of people who are in the reopen the government, um, you know, protesting stage and in a lot of, I mean, at least they showed in like Michigan, it's pretty much an astroturfed um, protest. Um, so I think that is worth exposing. Um, I think that leading with a message that is about public safety and public health is is paramount. I understand your concern that they were able to raise money off of it, but that's bad money that you don't no, want, right? No, we raised like, the money. Excuse oh, me. you raise it. We oh, raise sorry. That's great. That's wonderful. We raised um, the money. Yeah. So then the question is just how, how best to get out that message that how, we, how to raise more or yes. how to keep using it. Yes. How to yeah. keep that momentum going. I, I would say um, to provide a contrast, um, you know, here's what they're doing. Here's what we're doing. Here's what like normal people are doing right now and thinking about. Okay. That's great advice, Christy. I, I wanted to piggy off on, actually on what Angela was saying, and this is a question for you, Jane. Um, you were saying that there's a lot of distrust on the federal level, right? And last week we were talking to an expert who was fearful that given how people are feeling about the president, that people might not go and vote, but that's going to have grave consequences down ballot. And I'm wondering then if um, Jane, what do you think if people are feeling distrustful or, or angry right now at the federal government? Do you think it will have, a, a, could have a negative effect in, in, um, in November? Or do you think that by then the feelings would have changed? Um, I think it depends on, uh, this is the most like cliched pollster answer ever too, is it depends. <laughs> um, and I, I do, but I do think it depends on um, where in the country um, we're talking about. Um, and also, uh, what happens um, in between now and then, right? So we, you know, typically, um, you know, a lot of these emotions when people are distrustful and to um, Professor Bauer's point, distrust often does turn into fear 
um, in a lot of ways, but not necessarily as in you know, they're distrustful, so they're fearful. Um, they're feel they're fearful that that distrust will continue. So in some ways, that distrust can actually be a motivating factor for folks to turn out and vote. But I think it really remains to be seen with how campaigns harness sort of the political environment right now and like echo it within their campaigns in a responsible way. Um, you know, I don't think we necessarily want to be fear mongers, but you know, we are in an unprecedented scary political time right now. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for that being a motivating factor for people to turn out um, and vote. Um, we don't necessarily, necessarily see, um, you know, like Oklahoma, for example, is a really conservative state. Um, they have a lot, inversely, they have a lot of trust in the federal government, particularly um, Republican elected officials, but they have um, a, a really unique willingness to ticket split down ballot. Um, and so actually, um, folks, um, I do a lot of work in Oklahoma for women candidates there. Actually, we were able to elect three Democratic women to the state Senate in 2018, um, which was pretty remarkable in Oklahoma. Uh, it was super exciting. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of distrust in that state's government in particular because of the way their budgets have been managed. One in five children in Oklahoma only go to school four days a week because of the way that their budget is managed. So, um, you know, that influences the way that people show up to vote for those um, legislative uh, tickets, and then they just check the Republican box at the top of the ticket. So, um, you know, it depends. Um, and I think that, you know, it remains to be seen. Also, if this response continues to be bungled, um, I think that's going to encourage a lot more people to show up and vote. I mean, look at the waves of folks that showed up to vote for women in 2018. It was remarkable. So I'm hoping that we'll actually see it um, work the inverse way coming up. But if responses are still, um, where voting is unsafe and you have states that are forcing people into voting in public uh, in person, um, I think that could be interesting as well. So definitely keep your eye on what's happening with vote by mail. That'll be um, really interesting as well. Great, thank you. Um, I know that we just have a couple of more minutes. So Mark, do we have one or two more questions? Yep, we have Mia next. Mia, go ahead. Hi, ladies. <clears throat> so, um, it's kind of a great focal point that Lauren ended it on, on vote by mail. So our Texas Democratic Party actually won um, in regards to our state allowing uh, voting by mail. Uh, our concern is that there, there's more likely going to be an appeal. So how do we uplift our communities to either um, <clears throat> submit or uh, to submit for either absentee balances or vote by mail or what do you all recommend we should do? I'm running, I'm helping with a, a candidate who is on her uh, runoff race right now. Uh, our voting is until July 14th, but I just wanted to see what you, you ladies had in regards to that advice. Great question, Mia. So uh, Dr. Bauer or Christy, how do we motivate um, voters right now to action? Yeah, and this ties in with a question that Brenda has in the chat, which is how do we inspire people, you know, to, and so maybe it's text banking for us or phone banking for us or staying true to the mail and vote. What's, what are some advice there? Yeah. Um, so I guess specifically to your question about should you, is it, should you encourage people to get their mail-in ballots if it might be overturned and they might have to go in person anyway? Yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's then the, the then the message changes a bit. It's not exactly necessarily specific to get your mail in ballot. It's you know make sure that you're ready to go vote. You know get you know sure sir so like request that ballot or make a plan to go vote. I think it changes a little bit. Um, and um, you know and and again like it's not that I think the message has to be 100% COVID right now. I do think it has to be. Um, when we're talking about campaign communications, whether that is, I saw somebody in the chat asked about like a palm card or whatever, you know, I still think that a lot of the message, maybe not 100%, but a lot of it has to be about like um, how you are getting people kind of through this period right now, how you're thinking about it, what we need to do, you know, it's, it's still, um, it's still tied to it and it's still sort of of a, um, more of a, you know, more of a service model. Okay. Yeah, and I would just add, I think with the, especially with the, the voting situation being up in the mail, you can keep people updated with what's going on. Maybe not every week, but just, you know, here's the situation and, 
you know, these are, this is what could happen if it's going to be a vote by mail, but be prepared for this is what voting in person might be like, and here's how you can protect yourself to vote in person, right? You know, here's a mask. You can have like tutorials for how to make masks at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's, you know, stay mm -hmm. this far apart, bring things for you to do, bring protest signs for while you have to stand in line to, to vote in person if you have to do so while it's not safe. But pe keeping people informed because the biggest problem and takeaway that I've seen coming out of Wisconsin from a few weeks ago was that people just, a lot of people just didn't know what was going on and what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. With, with their voting situation. So like keep people informed of what's going on. And if you keep people angry, that's a good thing for getting people to turn out to vote. If you keep them a little bit angry, it's a good emotion. Fantastic. I also say if you're, you know, keeping them informed, but also if you feel it's appropriate, you know, giving them opportunities to, yeah, to protest this in whatever way, to, you know, lobby their government on, you know, the things that are happening. Those feel like, you know, good ways to, to get people and keep them engaged. Um, Christy and Dr. Barr, I'm also hearing you guys say that once we get people taking action, that that creates in itself a momentum that people will be paying attention even more, right? Um, so that's great. So I just want to say that we are on the hour and I said I led this conversation with uh, with the idea that we're going to respect our time. So if anybody needs to leave, um, you know, it's totally okay. Um, you can go. Um, but I thought maybe we could just do this for five more minutes. Mark, do we have just one more question that that we could ask? Yeah, I have uh, Laura here. Laura, go ahead. Laura, you have the final question. Oh, it's more of a of a statement. So I was just um, we were talking about leadership, showing leadership at this time. And there's a initiative we're working on. I sit on the board of the United Way, the capital region, and um, we're trying to find. Uh, we're highlighting success stories focused on health, courage, prosperity, and unity, all by wearing an orange ribbon. And you'll soon start to see political our um, our political officials wearing these orange ribbons. We're going to Congress. We're going to our I'm from Pennsylvania. We're going to our state legislature and our, our governor and lieutenant governor. They're going to start wearing orange. And so for, uh, for all you folks out there, if you want to start getting orange ribbons ready and uh, gather stories of these good stories, these, these hopeful stories out of this COVID-19 situation. So it was more of a statement. I'm, I apologize. It wasn't the question. <laughs> Well, thank you, Laura. And for me, as I reflect on what I've heard from Christy and Jane and Dr. Bauer, I feel like this session or this call was very much about the C's, right? Um, don't be afraid to show um, compassion and be caring and your competency, but also don't forget to connect and sometimes maybe contrast yourself with your opponent. And most importantly, continue that even this time of um, upside downness that we have to continue and persist right nevertheless she persisted so i want to thank you all for a joint for joining us on this saturday morning um, i want to thank jane and christy and dr bauer for your expertise i want to thank the vote run lead staff who've been preparing this call this whole week and again i just want to thank you all for being the great leaders and the people that we need at this moment